Welcome to our Sound for Video session. Today is the 20th of August, 2018. No, 2017. <laughs> Got a year ahead. Sorry about that. Uh, we have a question and answer session. Let's jump right in. First question is from Jeff Brass. Hi, Curtis. Offer some thoughts on which is better when recording. Dual recording with a safety track or an analog limiter compressor like in the Sound Devices Mix Pre 3. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, my personal preference is for a limiter in something like the Sound Devices Mix Pre 6. The reason I say that is that it can save you a lot of time in post. And if you gain correctly, if you gain stage correctly, set up your gain structure right, you shouldn't engage the limiter very often at all. Only in extreme circumstances where the talent get really loud. I do have a, a potential tip here that I learned just recently from my brother, in fact. Um, when you're setting the gain level for a recording, and it's going to be dialogue, it's helpful to get the person who you're trying to set the level for to laugh because you can usually use that as a, um, in, in addition to having them talk about some things uh, and just capturing some regular dialogue to laugh, it gives you a sense for how loud things could potentially get under most circumstances if you're doing an interview or talking head type thing. So that's a, a tip there. The, again, we talked about last week how to uh, cut in a safety track in post and uh, show you how to do that. That's a lot of time potentially. Um, again, even then, you shouldn't need to use it a lot. But again, if I had a choice, I would rather have a good limiter or a compressor to take care of things while I'm recording. Next question, Jeff actually also wrote again and said, Hi again, I have some audio recorded on an Atomos Shogun Inferno. Recorded levels in general seem fine, and for the most part, it sounds fine with some peaks getting up to minus 2 dB, but these peaks sound clipped and distorted. Would minus 2 dB generally give a distorted sound, or is this possibly a limitation of the Atomos preamps. My sense is that it's probably the Atomos preamps. In practice, um, actually in theory and in practice, in theory at least, I should say, you should be able to go up to 0 dB true peak and not clip and not distort. In practice, um, even if the, the peak is at minus 2 dB, it can still distort because that's probably not a measure of true peak. And in true peak, if you have two samples that stay under 0 dB, but the actual analog sound has to go beyond that, you can get some funny things happening um, with clipping and distortion. So um, yeah, it's, it's, it's possibly a limitation of digital recordings in general. It's also possibly something that the Atomos is doing. In general, you'll want to stay lower than that if you can possibly do that. So thanks for the questions, Jeff. Next up, a question, actually two, from Rena Sherman. Uh, number one. Uh, Rena says, I work with a GH4, may get a GH5 sometime, 5 sometime in the near future, to which I can connect a Zoom H5 on a lateral, lateral arm mounted on a mini tripod head so that I can see the control window. That is one of the things with the Zoom H5 is ergonomically it's a little bit funky to use when you're going to mount it on your camera rig, so I understand the frustration here. This is the only way I found to mount it so that I can see the window even though I have no, even though I have to move my head slightly or my eyes at least, which distracts from keeping an eye on the image. I work on the fly and can rarely use a tripod, so I need to remain as light and mobile as possible. Here with an image of the rig to show you. So here's a picture of the camera rig. Here's the GH4. This is the back. Looks like a shotgun microphone um, or some sort of XLR-based microphone, the H5, and an LED light mounted on the rig. And then here is the front of the rig right here. One thought I do have for you, Rena, is you potentially could send a feed from the H5 into the Panasonic GH camera. And then um, a f uh, probably about two months ago, we did a, set, a piece on how to match the levels between the two. And uh, then you could use the meters on your GH, so you don't have to keep looking back at this. Now, you, you can still record on the H5 and use that as your main production audio. But at least that will give you some levels on the GH4. You just have to make sure that you calibrate the, the two meters on the two systems so that they show the same thing. So that is a tip that I have for you that hopefully that will help and keep your eyes focused on the camera as opposed to having to kind of switch back and forth between the two. Second question from Rima is, uh, I will be teaching initiation classes in visual anthropology, video and photo to young scholars and we need a single camera that can do both. I initially thought of the Lumix G7, but there is no possibility to monitor sound, and we must have sound. We must have that so that students understand from the beginning the importance of best possible sound. Would you have any idea of another camera of this kind that would have a headphone out jack or a microphone that one can mount on the camera with a headphone jack, 
or a totally different solution. Thanks in advance. Kind regards, Rena. Well, um, I do have some thoughts here. Let's just take a quick look over on this side. So, of course, there is the GH4. Uh, perhaps when you upgrade to your GH5, the GH4 can become that camera. That's my first thought. Um, I don't know if that's possible or not. That is a thought. Um, I, there are so many cameras out there, and there are so few that I know about, to be honest. I, I'm not exactly a camera guy. <laughs> so um, there's so many cameras coming out that it's hard for me to keep up on all of them. Um, I... So I don't really have any recommendations. Panasonic, I guess I could say Panasonic does have some fixed lens cameras that might work. There are a lot of different video cameras, dedicated video cameras, but actually you need one that does photos as well. So that's out. Um, Sony, of course, has cameras, but the problem is they all get up into the $1,000 range before you really have microphone inputs, except for some of the Canon DSLRs. Um, I don't know... Uh, or Nikon DSLRs as well. I don't know if that's really what the direction you want to go. Um, that's entirely up to you. It's it's kind of funny because um, I understand what you're asking and it's a, it's a valid question. Um, I always hesitate to give camera buying advice because it's almost like a like telling someone which religion they should consider um, because there's so many personal things about how you work and so you know so many contextual things that I don't know about how you're working here to help with that. My, my initial thought though, when you asked the question was, well, maybe you should hold on to your GH4 when you sell or when you buy your GH5, that way you could use the GH4 for this purpose. So that's my, I guess my main thought. Another thing to consider is um, using an audio adapter. Um, an audio adapter is nice because if you just have a microphone input and there are, are a lot of cameras that just have a microphone input as well, but don't have a headphone output jack. Um, if you use a, an adapter like this, you get a, a headphone jack. So that's another option as well. Um, so something to keep in mind here. This particular one I reviewed some time ago, and you can find that over on my main channel. And actually, I also com compared it to a couple of other um, adapters as well, one from Ceramonic and one from Juice Link. I'm not entirely sure, but when I went to go look for the Juice Link page, it looks like maybe it's down. So I don't know if they've gone out of business or having some technical issues or something. That's unfortunate because they made pretty good adapters, um, if that's the case. But Beach Tech makes decent ones and Ceramonic makes decent ones as well. So thanks for that question, Rena. Next up from Kevin Edwards. Good morning, Curtis. I regularly use your videos as a point of reference. Um, I think that's, we'll skip ahead a little bit here. So to my question, I'm looking at rationalizing my microphone collection as many of them have not seen the light of day for a while. The only ones I use regularly are my 416, which is the Sennheiser MKH 416 shotgun microphone, and my 4053B, and there he's referring to the Audio-Technica 4053B hypercardioid small diaphragm condenser mic, and he's planning to keep both of those, but the sale of the other will others will free up some cash, which I'll invest back into a microphone. So of the current crop of microphones available, either new or used, with a budget of between 1,200 pounds to 1,600 pounds, would you invest in and why? Well, um, I would say, Kevin, and to anyone else there, um, um, I would always have a purpose when you're buying something, any piece of gear. There should be a purpose. It should be a problem you're trying to solve. It should be something that you sh you're trying to solve for a particular type of shooting that you do regularly. Um, and to have a, an MKH 416 and an Audio Technica 4053B in a kit that can cover a lot of situations. And I assume you're talking about another uh, boom microphone of some sort because you didn't mention anything about lavalier microphones. Um, you know, my, my I guess my initial thought is, is there's part of me that would love to um, add a Sheps MK, how, what's it, I, I can't remember the exact number, 646. It's, a, it's the super cardioid, small diaphragm uh, condenser mic, which would really kind of take the place of the Audio Technica. Um, that's a very popular mic f amongst the pro uh, sound mixers, and there's a good reason for it. Works very well on a lot of people's voices. So um, I guess if I could sell all my other microphones, I would probably buy one of those, and I'll put a link to that down below. Um, but but again, I think unless there's really a reason for things like that, um, 
there may not be a purpose. It might be that you need to invest in something else. What I would do is kind of take a step back and ask yourself, what problems am I having during production that I need to solve? And that may be a good place to invest that money. So thanks for that question, Kevin. All right, next up from Zach Grimaldo. Hi, Curtis, thanks for all the energy you put into this. I have a hypercardioid mic that I never use. Maybe it's because I don't know when I should be using it. I always end up using a shotgun or a lav mic or both for interviews. In what situations should I get it out and think to myself, I should give the hypercardioid a listen? Well, that's a good question. Um, kind of the, the traditional thinking on this is that shotgun microphones are not usually best for indoor use. And let me explain that in a little bit more detail. I think really the thinking is, at least in my experience, is that if you're using it indoors in a reverberant room where you're getting the sound kind of bouncing off the walls and coming back towards the microphone, um, that's when I think shotgun microphones can get a little bit problematic, um, especially when the sound source is a little bit off axis. Say the microphone, you know, the microphone is coming at me here. If I get off axis a little bit like this, with a shotgun microphone in a reverberant space, that's when I start to pick up really strange phase and comb filtering effects. It sounds very warbly, typically. Um, so that's where I find that using a shotgun is not usually ideal if I am in a reverberant room. So typically people are using the hypercardioid in place of that in those circumstances. Um, so I would experiment in those circumstances. Again, if you're if you're shooting in a, a the same room all the time and the shotgun mic you're using is working just fine and you're not getting that warbling, comb filtering, phasey kind of strange sounds, then you may be fine to work with the shotgun mic. So it's not a hard and fast rule, but those are the circumstances under which a, a shotgun mic doesn't work so well indoors necessarily. So um, anyway, so that's a thought there. Hope that helps a little bit for um, your particular circumstances there, Zach, and thanks for the question. Next up from Thomas Filer. I recently bought the Audio-Technica 4053B. This is, it's like the day. Today is the day for the Audio-Technica 4053B. I'm thinking about buying the Rycote Cyclone blimp kit so that I can get a shock mount and pistol grip and wind jammer, etc. Most bang for the buck. And I have that combination, actually. Does this microphone perform well in outdoor applications, or is it primarily an indoor mic? If so, I might just get a shock mount. Well, let's pause there. Does it perform well in outdoor applications? You can actually listen to that on a video that I shot um, over here with my friend Levi over at Uphill Cinema. It's called Homeless. I'll put a link for it down below. In this, mic, uh, in this piece, we use the AT4053B and the Rycoat Cyclone for the entire time. There were some problems. Um, there are some shotgun mics that have more reach, if you will, than the AT4053B. And that technically doesn't mean reach. What it means is that it has a smaller, uh, a narrower pickup pattern um, so that it, it feels like more reach. That means you can move the microphone a little bit farther away and it will still pick up the same amount of um, ambient sound. So anyway, so if you want to hear what it sounds like, come on, come over here and take a look at this piece. It's not perfect. Um, the reason I ended up using it on this piece is that we were going to shoot indoors first and indeed we did, but the problem was is I didn't have time to just switch out to my shotgun microphone, so I ended up just go running with it the whole time. So that's one um, look there. I would say that, yeah, it can be used outdoors. You do need to get it in pretty tight, pretty close to the talent to make it work really well, um, but, it, but it definitely can work. So that's, uh, that's something to consider there. Thanks for the question, Thomas. And then we have one last question from Martin LeBell. Hi, Curtis. I'm running for my phone, so it's going to be short and sweet on my Zoom F8 with a, an SM58 on channel 1 with a 15-foot Digiflex XLR cable. I'm catching an FM radio station that is not actually playing in the room. Have you ever experienced this, and why? Well, I have not, Martin. I have not experienced that, so I would go through the normal troubleshooting. It sounds like you should have a pretty decent quality cable. I hadn't heard of Digiflex, but it looks like it's a um, Canadian company that... Uh, focuses on cables, so I'm going to assume that those are pretty high quality cables. Um, here's the things here are the things I would check immediately. I would try a different mic first of all. Uh, I would make sure that all the channels that you're not using are turned off. I would make sure that phantom power is turned off because you don't need it on any of the channels. Um, I would swap out the microphone. I would swap out the cable and and see if that makes any changes. So what you're trying to do is find out where the problem lies. It is possible, I suppose, that a cable could, a balanced cable could be having some problems. Uh, 
trying to think of the circumstances where you may have a loose connection on one of the pins and still get sound. Uh, I don't know. Anyway, uh, I would just do the the typical troubleshooting where you replace each individual item in the signal chain, turn off anything you don't need, and narrow it down to where the problem is coming from. So best wishes on that. So those are the questions we had for this week's Sound for Video session. I hope that you're all getting out there and making some great sound recordings, and we will talk to you again next week. Take care, everybody.